All right. <laughs> that always works so well. Um, uh, welcome to another edition of uh, the York Heritage Research uh, Seminars. I'm very excited to be able to introduce the archaeological um, illustrator and artist, uh, Kelvin uh, Wilson, who's traveled very far, well, from the Netherlands, <laughs> um, to come and join us. Uh, I was saying to Kelvin, I wasn't sure, I'd like to tell a personal story when I'm introducing um, people. And Kelvin, I met, uh, we decided in 2009, uh, at a conference which was the the, the low point in my in my PhD <laughs> um, career. He basically saved me from what was a very traumatic experience at uh, uh, a conference, and uh, we have been friends ever since. Um, and uh, he's since then participated in various projects that I and others in the room have been involved in, including the visualization and archaeology um, project sponsored by English at Heritage. Kelvin is a real boundary pusher, uh, I think, in the field of visualization uh, in archaeology. And I think he'll tell you a bit more about how that came about <laughs> based on his own um, background. But what is m most exciting about him, I think, is that he has been working for uh, a variety of uh, audiences and been commissioned by everyone from National Geographic to more local um, museums uh, to do reconstruction and other uh, work in the heritage and archaeological sector. So he's doing some really exciting things and always has very provocative um, ideas uh, to share. And I'll turn it over um, to Kelvin to provide more of an introduction. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. <laughs> um, I've been asked to give a short introduction. So uh, I am Kelvin Wilson. I have lived in the Netherlands for 40 out of my 40 plus years. Uh, from when I was a little boy, um, and we we're just talking about the time when I uh, applied for full membership of the Association of Archaeological Illustrators, and one thing that they noted then is that I had an art college background, and apparently that was rather peculiar, because everybody else, and there's a few exceptions to it, who has an art college uh, background, but uh, most archaeological illustrators apparently have a background in archaeology, They've studied archaeology, decided to go on the trail of, uh, of our classical illustration. Now, because of my background, and of course my friends, my colleagues, my closest friends and colleagues being commercial illustrators, um, I have a rather, I believe, uh, um, a different outlook on the reconstructing of the past. I do it out of love, I do it for other people, I do it often for very commercial reasons, in the sense I have to communicate an idea which is forced to make other people money. And, um, uh, and I don't see um, the truth as a holy cow, which I should not be driving past. And what happened when I was about 19, 20 years old, I caught sight of not these issues, two out of the same series. And I was totally perplexed by them because I believe they were real, even though they're set in the late 18th century. I know they cannot be real. They cannot be real photographs. These are by an American illustrator called Howard Pyle, who's a, a godfather of American uh, illustration uh, art. Uh, the one that I saw, by the way, was of an 18th century uh, riot during the 18th century uh, uh, election. And everybody was tumbling over each other. There wasn't, there wasn't a spot about it that wasn't perfectly photorealistic in an almost news, news uh, uh, style. Now, 
I know these are not meant as historical reconstructions. I can tell that these are narrative illustrations. And it has to do, for instance, with the composition of this one, which puts me here inside the scene, and I look past this man, so I slightly turn to the side, I, I see that man, I see the rest behind. It's a narrative technique. Same with this one, it's based on news photographs, so it's supposed to make me believe that I'm part of the, of the scene, and uh, that I'm saying, in this case, the inauguration of George Washington, I believe, it, well, somewhere in the 18th century. Um, so I know that these are not historical accurate, that they have no intention to be accurate, accurate uh, uh, reconstructions of the past. Now, you've just seen this one. This is one of mine. And yet, you believe, most people believe, this is an accurate, accurate representation of the past. And it is. Because uh, this is a site, the Roman uh, uh, fort of Hochelburg in Utrecht, in the Netherlands. The archaeologist took me there one evening. I was, it's a friend of mine. I was having dinner at his house. He took me out to the site. We actually walked the breath of the excavation. Um, he told me, so I had an idea of what the scale was like. He told me about very accurate, very like waterlogged conditions, very accurate uh, dendrological uh, um, uh, dates for the uh, uh, for the building phases, which pointed to the uh, to the fact that somewhere at the beginning of the second century, uh, Emperor Hadrian, on a tour across the Limes, the German, oh, sorry, the uh, the um, the Roman border on the sort of uh, facing uh, the German uh, old lands, um, uh, decided that everything that was given to me of wood should be set in stone. And of course, he crosses the North Sea, arrives in England, and that's apparently now the accepted first date for the stonification of uh, Hadrian's Wall. So my brief was to uh, reconstruct um, um, a view of the Vigas, and uh, what I wanted to get across was um, uh, the idea that they had a need to stone, uh, rebuild their thinking stone, so it had to be muddy, dilapidated, and well, muddy and dilapidated and grey and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, the idea was that I was going to draw the procession of the emperor, but uh, as you can see, I sort of uh, moved that to the side. Now, if I had gotten you so far as to see that in this picture, and believe me, this picture is used a lot, documentaries, panels, books, anybody who needs an image of our Roman uh, a town outside of a, uh, the Landstreit House, as they call it in German, uh, a Roman town outside a Roman fort, uh, will use this image. Serious publications as well as uh, general public, uh, publications. Um, if I have gotten used so far as to believe that this is therefore a correct representation of the past, I haven't gotten used so far as to think as Roman, as Roman would see it. I've gotten used so far as to think as I saw it. Because, in reality, the whole situation, of course, is 360 degrees around. I could have chosen any day of the year. I could have chosen any viewpoint. I could have reconstructed any detail, and it would have been correct. But I chose to direct your eyes to the things that I find important, like, for instance, the fence that is falling apart, to give you an idea that a lot of the country is soggy and that they want to rebuild everything in a more permanent state. I have designed this view of the past. And same with this one. Again, it's perfectly correct as to the archaeology. The cows are the right size, the farm and the orientation.
people in Syrian museums like what I wanted you to have from this picture is to like it. If anything is incorrect, which it, which it will, still will be, that is secondary to the fact that people like this as an image of the past. Therefore, it sells well. Therefore, it sells the past well. I'm not the only one who does it. This is from, what did I say, 1996. This is an article in the German magazine about uh, um, uh, the discovery of the ice mummy, you would see. And, um, and of course, it's in a different style. Just disregard that, because that's just a choice of the illustrator. Um, uh, the fact is, is that everything in this picture is meant to be correct. It's also sure people who otherwise know nothing about the uh, the, the late Neolithic, early Calcolithic, Calcolithic of uh, Calcolithic, I think you say, of, uh, of the Alps, um, uh, tell them something they don't know. Like, for instance, what kind of uh, wheat would they have grown? What kind of uh, tools would they have used? What kind of uh, houses would they have lived in? This is to the best of the archaeologist's knowledge what it would have been like. But there are also concepts added to this by the illustrator simply to make it more palpable. For instance, there is something called cleanliness. <laughs> like there is a broom. There are, of course, children in, always in the foreground playing. So the picture is actually, which is purported to be correct, is actually being made to make you like the picture. Now, I tested this once on a group of students. Uh, I gave them a case study. It was a commission that I had as well. And it was a, well, you can read one of this, a 15th century uh, uh, before the Common Era, 5th century, sorry, what did I say? Um, uh, east of the Netherlands, Nijmegen, which is just near the German border. Uh, they found uh, these people buried. And what they had found was this man. That's his um, um, uh, skull with the bronze braid rings in, uh, in still in situ, uh, lying on his back, and a probable woman lying buried over him, hand in her neck. So, um, of course, I asked the archaeologist, what's the deal? And he said, well, the closest we can come with our theories is that Caesar Caesar later, a few, a few centuries later, at that time actually by the way they thought it was first century BC, I have to say that. Um, uh, I wrote about uh, if a Germanic woman had was accused of poisoning poisoning her husband, uh, she could have been uh, chopped and thrown into the grave uh, after the, uh, with her uh, husband. So um, I gave this case study to uh, a group of students and I told the story and I talked about well, why, why would you poison me? And they said, well, maybe it wasn't very nice. Mm -hmm. And I gave them a few uh, um, um, general stuff of the era, so for instance, textiles from the Holstock mines in Austria. And I don't have their pictures, but I have a general view of what they came up with. <laughs> <laughs> which was a guy deserving of being crushed. <laughs> uh, sorry, you're poisoned. So what they were illustrating, even though I'd given them as much information as we had available, what they were illustrating, what they were reconstructing, was a narrative. They were filling in the narrative. And of course, all the stuff I gave them was irrelevant to this one grave find in the East of Netherlands. I mean, textiles of the era uh, of the of, uh, found elsewhere in Europe, of course, totally irrelevant. It's some kind of an idea of colours, perhaps, but totally irrelevant to this story. In fact, to be honest, you wouldn't be able to do anything with the skeleton, because that's all it is, a skull with a few rings, which are more or less in situ, and which are only being interpreted as great rings. Of course, that's not how I earn my money. So I had to make one as well. <laughs> and I made this one, which is just as bad a narrative as theirs was. Although in my case, I changed them, I made them blonde. I think that's another thing. Everybody had given black hair. Black hair is for babies. <laughs> um, 
and the big moustaches, by, by, uh, by the way, I agree with moustaches. I purposely did not give him a moustache. What happened was, and this one appeared in the newspapers, is that people started, uh, somebody wrote a letter into the newspapers. What's this? <laughs> no beard, not a prehistoric man without a beard, and young artists have to send in another letter. Well, they didn't actually have razors, you know, and it's just a, a polemic which is nonsensical. But this is what attracted the polemic the fact that they thought they were looking at a real Iron Age person, which it is not. Very popular, though. This is just a